In July of 1945, a single event changed the world forever. Actress Helen Mirren was born at the Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea Hospital in London, England, entering the world into a period widely known as the Renaissance. Also that month, the first nuclear bomb was detonated in the Trinity Test, which is what this video is actually about, because my plan to rename the channel Helen as Marie Interesting got shot down by my lawyers. Anyways, blah blah blah, introduction, blah, nuclear bomb, blah blah, steel before 1945 is extra valuable, blah blah blah, let's get into the video. Now look, everybody knows that nuclear bombs change the world. You don't need to tell me that any more than you need to tell me that Helen Mirren is an international treasure. But typically we talk about how nukes change the world in a geopolitical sense, or a technological sense, or a committing giant war crime sense. We less often talk about how nuclear bombs literally changed the world, like physically, chemically altered the entire actual Earth. You see, the detonation of atmospheric nuclear bombs released atoms into Earth's atmosphere that had never before existed on Earth. Radioactive isotopes like cesium-137 or plutonium-139, or more importantly for our story, cobalt-60. Famously, Kodak accidentally figured out the top secret information that the United States has successfully tested the first nuclear bomb because high levels of cerium-141 were ruining photo development in southwest Indiana over 1,000 miles away from where the Trinity test was conducted in New Mexico. Today, these isotopes are spread throughout the entire Earth's atmosphere. In fact, you can prove whether or not wine was bottled before or after the Trinity test because the wine bottled afterwards will contain cesium-137, which didn't exist on Earth before the first nuclear explosion, which was used to show that a wine collection that supposedly belonged to Thomas Jefferson was a fake. Similarly, the sudden, drastic increase in worldwide carbon-14 levels known as the bomb peak can be used to determine if an artwork is a forgery by testing the carbon-14 levels in the oil used to bind the paint. You can also tell if a person was born before 1945 simply by asking them how old they are. Now, for no particular reason, let's talk about how to make steel. Steel making is a relatively straightforward process. You take pig iron, you melt it, you blow air through it to oxidize the impurities, you remove those impurities, and cow blowy, you've got yourself some steel. The trouble is, ever since the Trinity test, now the air has these pesky radioactive particles in it, including cobalt-60, which ends up getting deposited in the iron when the air is pumped through it. Now, it's not a lot of cobalt-60. In fact, modern steel is less radioactive than an average person is, and normally those low radiation levels aren't a problem. You can use this modern steel to build all kinds of stuff. Bridges, or cars, or beams that can't be melted by jet fuel. But if that steel is going to be used in something like a Geiger counter, or to build thick walls intended to shield equipment like a whole body counter from radiation, it's a huge problem. You can't build devices that test for radioactivity with radioactive components. That would be like Simon Cowell judging a show called America's Got Normal Looking Faces. Now, there are ways to prevent this by using pure oxygen instead of dirty regular air in a totally clean room environment. But that's hard, and it's expensive, and also you wouldn't have clicked on a video titled Why Steel Making is Sometimes Done with Pure Oxygen in a Clean Room Environment. The much easier solution is to just use steel made before 1945. And it just so happens, there's a ton of it sitting at the bottom of the ocean. To understand why, you have to understand something called World War I. World War I was invented by this man, Jeremiah World War I, and it's basically like a prequel to World War II. If you're still confused, it helps to think of World War II like Shrek 2 and World War I like Shrek 1. Hopefully that helps. Anyways, during World War I, the Germans were doing a lot of killing people, and then too much killing people got done to them, so they decided to stop and surrender to the Allies. They had a surface fleet that they were supposed to hand over to the British, but a German rear admiral called Ludwig von Reuter decided to instead sink the fleet so that it couldn't be used against Germany if the peace fell through. Which means there's a bunch of perfectly good, cobalt-free, pre-1945 steel sitting at the bottom of Scarpa Bay in Scotland. And you know what they say about when there's pre-1945 steel at the bottom of Scarpa Bay. You've got to, uh, you know, go get it to make medical devices and stuff. Which is exactly what people did, and continue to do. And it's not just low background steel that's high key useful. Low background lead has proven to be even more valuable, needed for everything from computer ships to the equipment used to look for dark matter. It turns out lead that sat at the bottom of the ocean for centuries is not only uncontaminated by nuclear tests, but its own already low natural radiation is almost completely exhausted, plus the ocean has shielded from cosmic rays. That's how 2,000 year old lead from an ancient sunken Roman ship ended up used in experiments by Italy's cryogenic underground observatory for rare events, and why University of Chicago keeps a stockpile of lead from the ballast of the Spanish San Ignacio, which sank in 1733. It's also why I mixed my own ancient lead into the paint in my house, because I believe in safety first. To end this video, I have good and bad news. 
The good news is, thanks to the 1963 Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, atmospheric nuclear tests are now banned, and worldwide radioactivity levels have decreased to the point that newly made steel can be used for all but the most radiation-sensitive tasks. The bad news is that there's an awesome streaming site called Nebula that's got all kinds of incredible exclusive content from your favorite educational creators. Wait a minute, that's not bad news at all! Whoops, I guess I accidentally did a super engaging subversive ad transition, I hate it when I do that. Look, sometimes we here at A Half As Interesting want to make a thing, but we're worried that it'll be too weird and that the YouTube audience won't like it. Nebula solves that problem by letting us make weird stuff free from the wrath of the algorithm. Stuff like Half As Interesting's Crime Spree, a real-world cross-country crime game show where I go around America breaking laws and my writers chase after me. There's also H.I.'s Brick Special, add-in sponsorship-free versions of all our YouTube videos, extended cuts, extra videos, and even content from the rare creators that aren't me. The best way to get access to Nebula is with the Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle, where you also get access to the fantastic documentary streaming site Curiosity Stream, which happens to have this really great one called The Colorado Problem, A River in the Red, which is narrated by a guy who sounds weirdly like me. You can get the bundle on sale for just $14.79 for the whole year by going to curiositystream.com slash H-A-I.